Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and participants of the World Investor Week in the AIFC. My name is Almaz Jolomanov, and I'll be moderating this webinar, Financial Education in Investment Decisions. I'll do some technical announcements. Uh, you may ask your questions through the chat function, and we will collect all the, all, all the questions and respond them uh, in the end of the webinar. Translation services into Russian and Kazakh languages are also available for you. Uh, you may choose the language uh, interpretation uh, through the globe icon in your uh, navigation panel of Zoom. Um, we, we have today um, distinguished uh, speakers that administer uh, professional financial certification programs that empower people with uh, financial skills necessary for financial well-being. And I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, our speakers. Paul Grimes, Chief uh, pro, uh, Chief Professionalism Officer of the Financial Planning Standards Board, FPSB. The FPSB is the organization that leads the global financial planning profession and owns the Certified Financial Planner Certification Program. Paul served in numerous FPSB network leadership positions, including FPSB, Europe, uh, FPSB Ireland CEO, Chief Executive Officer, Chairperson of the FPSB Council, FPSB Europe Chairperson, um, and a member of, the, of uh, FPSB Network Member Advisory Group and Chief Executive Committee. Uh, in addition, he worked uh, with FPSB on standard setting as a member of the Professional Standards Committee, Global uh, Exam Working Group, Integrated Financial Plan Working Group, and Financial Advisor Credential Working Group. Paul is currently an Associate Faculty Member at the University College of Dublin. And, and an independent financial planner, consultant, business coach, and trainer at Principal Grimes International Business and Training Souls. He earned diplomas in financial planning from, uh, from Deakin University and Ireland University College Dublin and holds the CFP credential. Our next speaker is William Tome. William uh, is a chartered financial analyst. He is a senior regional head of Middle East and North America, uh, North Africa at the CFA Institute and is, a, in, and is based in the CFA Institute office in Abu Dhabi. Uh, in his role, William advocates for the highest standards of practice and ethics in the, inter, in, in the investment management industry through the promotion of financial market integrity and transparency among regional policymakers and regulators. Prior to joining CFA Institute, William was a director for institutional business development at Lazard, where he developed a sovereign institutional client uh, business in the Middle East, covering uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Oman, Egypt, Jordan, and Bahrain. Prior to his role, he was a director uh, of uh, Middle Eastern institutions, uh, Alliance uh, Bernstein Middle East. And our, our uh, next speaker is Klaus. Paisler, Chartered Financial uh, Analyst, and is the Senior Director uh, for Institutional Relations at the, uh, for the um, uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa at the CFA Institute. Uh, he's based in London. Klaus heads the team uh, managing CFA Institute's relationships with the financial services firms, such as asset managers, asset owners, banks, and professional services firms uh, across Europe, uh, the Middle East, and Africa. Klaus joined the CFA Institute from Millennium Global Group, where uh, most recently he was a head of uh, business development and marketing, uh, responsible for leading uh, growth strategies across uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, uh, Latin America, and North America. Prior to that, he was Russell Investments. He was at Russell Investments uh, in both the US and the UK. Uh, laterally, as the Director of Investment Solutions for Northern Europe, he, will, he has extensive experience working in client-facing roles, both as a product specialist and portfolio manager, and in executing business growth strategies covering multiple asset classes. With this introduction, I'm pleased to uh, hand over to our first speaker, Mr. Paul Grimes. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Almas, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'm uh, speaking to you today from London, where I'm attending another event uh, as part of the World Investor Week. So it's a, it's a great honor to be with you uh, uh, today. Uh, just bear with me for one moment while I uh, share my screen. 
There we go. Okay, so so to the topic at hand for the next 20 minutes and the matter of financial literacy and whether it matters or not. And uh, I, I think the answer to that is unequivoc unequivocally, yes, it, it does matter. Um, and, and I'll hopefully uh, walk through with you some reasons as to why it is of the utmost importance uh, for investors to be as financial literate as is possible. Um, so uh, just very briefly in terms of Financial Planning Standards Board and, and who we are, uh, Almas has already introduced uh, the organization uh, just to say that it's present in 27 territories uh, globally at the moment uh, with about 200,000 certified financial planners practicing uh, internationally. So, um, so what I wanted to do over the next short number of slides is give you, give you a brief overview of what I mean by uh, financial planning and the uh, role that investments play within the financial planning dynamic um, and, and then dealing with uh, financial literacy as, 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 to, as to why it matters in the context of this journey. So, so the, the slide that's uh, on screen at the moment shows a journey uh, which uh, effectively starts back when, when a, an individual starts their working career. Um, and the, the, the principle here is that uh, as one goes through life, uh, the capacity to generate and accumulate investment capital is, is quite small in the early years, uh, unless there is inherited wealth, uh, which is not uh, often the case. And so it is only in the latter years that um, individuals are able to start to put in place proper savings plans and, and wealth accumulation strategies that enable the accumulation of capital. And I suppose, the, the journey naturally peaks at a point in time, and, and let's not talk about age uh, for the moment, uh, but, it, but it peaks at a point where one has accumulated sufficient capital so that if one chooses to do so, one could give up working uh, and instead live off the proceeds of the capital. So that might happen, uh, fortunately, for some people in their 40s, for some it's their 50s, for some it's their 60s, etc. But, but, but that is the, that's the natural sort of progression um, uh, over, one, over one's lifetime. And ultimately, as, as one gets to this point, there is a dependency on the capital, there's a, a decline in the value of the capital as one draws down earnings from uh, the, the wealth that has been accumulated throughout a working life. But ultimately, if, if we're lucky, there may be some value that's left, which, which will ultimately go to the next generation in the form of uh, uh, money left in whatever guise to, uh, to uh, descendants of, of, of a client. Um, but so, some key questions that, that arise on this journey uh, that one has to consider, and, and without being financially literate, they become, they become quite difficult to, 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 uh, to deal with. Uh, and one has a huge dependency then on uh, financial professionals. And I'll come to that and why that matters uh, shortly. But questions that need to be answered on this journey, what type of assets should you own? Uh, so in other words, should, should you buy a property that's available in the market, the local market? Uh, should you buy stocks or shares in a local company that has just started up? Should you buy gold? Uh, should you buy... Uh, some form of uh, uh, an investment that allows you exposure to um, a broad diversity of companies operating in different countries? And, and the answer to all of the, those questions is yes or maybe. <laughs> and it really depends on where you are on this journey and what it is that you're hoping to accomplish as to how much of each of what I've just described you should hold within an investment portfolio. So uh, the, the, the second consideration then is almost what type of ownership structure should be used to hold the assets. And there's a, there's a plethora uh, or many uh, uh, options available. So you can hold or own assets in your own personal name. You can own them in some sort of a trust structure, say for example, or you can have them within some sort of a collective ownership To invest into a range of companies, and um, what that uh, allows you to do then is to is to share the benefits of having uh, a diverse portfolio of interests rather than a very narrow uh, investment. So, but the ownership structure matters. Some 
considerations there are going to be uh, around you know taxation of those structures how does that work uh, are some structures more tax efficient than others is there for example a consideration to owning assets in a particular jurisdiction uh, uh, over uh, over another uh, so so there can be there can be some tax advantages to uh, to that type of consideration um, and i'm not talking about a legal holding of assets uh, uh, when i say that um and and uh, along this journey there needs to be a, a consideration to some form of uh, risk assessment and so essentially what you're looking to to gauge is if that's if that's the journey to wealth accumulation over time whatever that time frame is not normally and in most cases that that accumulation is dependent on some sort of activity that generates income and and most of it is to do with earnings uh, uh, at whatever level one one operates at as as somebody who is employed um and, and the key consideration then is going to be if the earnings were broken what would happen to this future picture and for most people it, it would be catastrophic so so there does need to be some thought to how that might be protected in the form of uh, mitigation strategies uh, whether that's insurance policies or whatever the case might be but that that will be a key part from a financial planning point of view of of, of that journey so you know, when we talk about financial planning i'll just pull this together very quickly as one example for you i haven't denom denominated it in any particular currency but i'm hoping it, it will it will uh, uh, give you some sense of the trade-offs that are involved in making key financial decisions not just an in investment but uh, uh, in financial matters generally so so a typical client can come to me you know with a that has you know certain financial resources that are available for use whether that's in the form of an annual cash flow uh, surplus uh, and it might be a significant sum of money that can be held in, in a bank however that has been uh, accumulated and, and the tendency oftentimes can be to launch a conversation around what do we do with this big lump sum of money and and oftentimes that's not the question that that actually needs to be contended with it is a consideration of what what life means for the client you know what what are what do we what, what are we living for what do we hope to get out of life is it you know do we hope to retire at some point in time in which case we need to accumulate big sums of capital is it that you know we we'd like to have our children educated to the highest possible standard and that's going to cost uh, money uh, uh, if i have debt whether that's to purchase my home or maybe some other uh, uh, things uh, should i continue paying the debt or should i should i pay uh, use these funds to pay it down there's there's interest rate considerations there interest rate arbitrage considerations as to what i might do there it's not it's not a black and white uh, decision so so the answer to all of these questions varies depending on on who it is that we that we deal with the nature of the client their individual circumstances and how it is that they want to uh, live their lives but i suppose what i'd like to say to you is uh, oftentimes what needs to be considered is a broader range of problems to be considered and solved than just how do you invest a big a big lump sum of money that 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 might be uh, that might be available for investment so so what the, 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 i suppose the topic of of today and, and what why it matters so so financial literacy um the, you know, cl clients need to understand the nature of markets the nature of assets and and critically the nature of risk and the idea of risk premia so so for example if you are going to invest into something that carries no risk whatsoever the relationship with the return that you can earn from that is is direct in that you will generate a very modest return so for example if you want to hold your money in cash in the bank interest rates at the moment internationally are quite low and so therefore there is a very uh, poor return to be earned from holding money uh, in cash um, and arguably it won't even keep rate keep pace with the rate of inflation and so uh, that's one end of the spectrum the other end of the spectrum is that you decide to uh, invest in say for example a um a portfolio of investments of small startup companies uh, and and the the difference in those two options is is diametrically opposed in that in investing into small startup companies there is a big risk that the company may fail and so you don't get your money back uh, but the other side of it is there is also a big opportunity that if the business is successful you get a very very significant reward from it so 
so the idea of risk premia being that if you're if you are looking to generate the highest possible return you must understand that you need to take an increase in risk in order to achieve that particular outcome uh, and and it, the task of the professional advisor uh, is to work with clients to understand that whilst everybody wants the highest possible uh, uh, return we need to ascertain what level of risk can the client tolerate within their circumstances so it's it's all it's it's easy to say i want a return of 15 percent we are all aware of of instruments that have that potential but we're also aware as financial professional financial advisors that they carry a lot of risk and we 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 need uh, clients to also be educated to understand uh, that 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 trade off and uh, to understand that uh, uh, if if one is going to pursue the highest possible return understand that it's possible that some of the investments may collapse and loss of capital uh, ensues and for most investors that i have dealt with over my uh, 30 years in financial services whilst they want the highest return most cannot take the type of risk i'm talking about and so it can lead to an imbalance where the client ignores advice and pursues the chase of a return to uh, very poor outcomes for them, not just at that moment in time, but can be catastrophic for, for, uh, for general wealth accumulation. So um, something, something as one small example in terms of why does it matter? Because if you don't understand it, what you are reliant upon is exclusively an advisor working with you and, and Therefore, the choice of your advisor perhaps becomes the single most important decision that you that you might make. Okay, uh, uh, and, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. You need to identify somebody who is who is professional in their in their uh, approach is ethical uh, to 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 work with you. Uh, uh, and and it's not a friend of your brother or your sister or somebody in the family. Uh, it's it's somebody who is independent and works on on your basis. Um, second thing I'll just draw your attention to is you need to understand what impact fees, taxes, and inflation have on your investment return. So, very very simple uh, uh, example is. If 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 you're investing into a, a say a collection of, uh, of 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 assets that you're given an indication has a potential return of say six percent uh, because of the diversity of the spread, uh, you need to understand that if you're paying fees of two percent already, two of your six percent has been allocated to uh, to the fees. So so you're now down to four percent. If there's taxes to be paid. Uh, you know, your your four percent may reduce further, and and now you're starting to come back down into something that's in line with inflation, and and really for the risk that you might be taking, you, you need to consider whether in the round, uh, that's that's a worthwhile investment structure. So so you need to know uh, what ex ex exclusively what fees uh, you're you're going to paying, what the tax situation is in relation to different financial instruments. Um, and and hopefully I don't know this situation with regulators in Kazakhstan, if I'm honest. But but hopefully there is a regulatory code that uh, uh, guides what professional advisors must disclose to you, because otherwise fees can be hidden within an investment uh, material. Um, understand your investment options. I've mentioned that already. I won't I won't repeat on that. But the, the key thing I want to say to you in, in relation to this is understanding that uh, knowledge is protection so so you need to um, you need to, uh, to 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 focus on who it is that you choose as a financial advisor um I'll skip through this very quickly there's a there's a number of slides here I won't uh, dwell on but part of what your financial advisor ought to be able to uh, consider in terms of setting up uh, investment structures for you is, macro level considerations such as taxation policy in, in, the, in, 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 in Kazakhstan and perhaps other areas that you might be investing into. If there are government retirement policies or welfare policies, that may be a consideration. But perhaps most importantly, in, in, in addition to the tax policy in particular, is where are we at in the economic uh, cycle? Uh, you know, what's the projection for uh, inflation, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the impact that has on uh, asset returns. So, so that's one sort of a, a macro picture that needs to be considered, but equally importantly is the specific client considerations that need to be considered, such as 
what stage of life is an individual at. So uh, as one gets older, one's capacity to take on an inordinate level of risk is limited. And so you, you cannot afford to take high risk in most cases uh, as you get to the stage of life where you are depending on your capital to provide you with, with, uh, with, with the standard of living that you want. Um, uh, and so you need greater diversity. Uh, so so all, all of that matters in terms of how, how you arrive at that decision. Um, I'll just very briefly touch on this uh, life expectancy. It is the case that internationally, uh, we're all living longer. Uh, these expectancy tables uh, uh, don't include Kazakhstan, unfortunately, but you, you get the set general impression here. Japan, uh, well, sorry, I should explain what, what this relates to is children who were born in the year 2007. The average life expectancy for children in Japan is 107. So that, by, by, by that, what that means is 50% will live longer than uh, uh, 107. That that has that has huge implications for the need to be able to accumulate capital in in one's personal name to be able to provide for those later years of life. Uh, and you can see that it's a trend across uh, all of the countries. I'm going to suggest that it is the same with Russia, Kazakhstan. Also, that this increased life expectancy uh, is 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 going to put pressure on all of us. Uh, as we live longer, is how do we how do we afford uh, uh, to live uh, to live longer? So, you know, it it, it lends itself to a change in on the organisation of life uh, in terms of uh, family structures will 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 evolve. Um, our own ability to work in later years of life may be called into question if we haven't accumulated the capital that we need uh, for for later years of life. So. Um, Really, uh, uh, from a financial planner perspective, um, in terms of working with clients, what, what it is that I will be saying to you is it's a collaborative uh, relationship between the, the, the financial planner and, and clients. Uh, there's a coaching element, so it, it shouldn't really be the situation where you as a client come to me as a financial planner to say, Paul, tell me what to do. There is a, a, an obligation on the financial planner to work with you to help you understand what your options are to guide you as to what I might feel is the best solution for you, um, given my understanding of your circumstances. Uh, but ultimately, you are a part of that decision-making uh, uh, decision process. And, and broadly, when we talk about financial planning, it's a, it's a, a series of competencies that exists across a broad range uh, of, of, uh, of financial areas. So from financial management, as in cash flow, right the way through to behavioral psychology. So uh, th that concludes my presentation. If there are any questions, I'll happily deal uh, with those later uh, with Alma. So uh, thank you, Alma. So I'll, I'll hand back to you now. Uh, interesting presentation on the merits of uh, financial planning for for, for the future prosperity, um, and I think you've you've touched up on um, very useful concepts around you know acting ethically, um, something that is, is is expected from the financial uh, ad advisors, and I think that is something uh, one of the integral elements of uh, um, you know CFA programs, and that sort of logically brings us to our next speakers from the CFA Institute. And um, I'm pleased to uh, pass the floor to William Tome. William, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for reminding us that a pillar, the mission of the Institute. So I'll start with the mission. Our mission at the CFA Institute is to lead the investment profession globally by promoting the highest standards of ethics, education, and professional excellence for the ultimate benefit of society, which means finance has to have a purpose. Uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, you're managing someone's savings for a future uh, financial goal. Uh, this involves the lives uh, of uh, the clients. This is why at the Institute, we insist on the fact that we need to put the interest of our clients first before the interest of your employer and before your own interests. And the ethics program uh, is, is existing through, sorry, the ethics part is the common denominator of all our programs. Whether you do the CFA program, the investment foundations, CIPM that we'll talk about a bit later, any program um, you, you touch on uh, up in, in the Institute, you will have to go through uh, um, a strong curriculum around ethics. 
If you don't have ethics as part of your priorities, you shouldn't be doing any job related to finance and any job related to managing clients' money. So here, our aim at the Institute is really to educate ethical investment professionals, prepare them for their careers. Maybe they are already in their careers and they needed an extra uh, certification, they needed an extra or an extra amount of knowledge. Uh, I'll take an example. If you are a, a fixed income uh, manager, uh, maybe you would like to know more about what's happening on the equity side or on the alternative side. This is why you would enroll in the CFA program, for example. So we want our uh, members to be knowledgeable and ethical and experienced in, uh, in the asset management or the investment industry. Uh, financial markets that operate efficiently and ethically. Again, we need to give finance a purpose future projects to finance, future retirement. Uh, maybe um, your li as, as, as Paul showed us, our lives are getting longer. Um, we need to finance this, uh, extra, these um, amounts of extra years uh, of retirement. So all in all, you have, we are promoting best practices, professionalism, but mainly, mainly ethics and knowledge. And I would not dissociate one from the other. I think that's it for the general uh, introduction around the CFA Institute. Of course, we are known uh, for the CFA program. Uh, this is where our, our golden reputation lies. Uh, and I'm conscious that recently we had lots of questions around the program. So I think it's worth it to go back to the basics and the, the foundations uh, of the program. Uh, if we ask the man or the woman on the street, they will tell us uh, among so many uh, MBAs in finance, uh, they decided to do the CFA uh, journey because it, it became the gold standards in, in, in financial education. It's not the only one, we are conscious about it, but it is personally, it, is, it was my motivation to enroll in the program when I learned in 2004 in Paris that it was an international passport in finance. Becoming a CFA charter holder is joining a family of 180,000 charter holders across the globe. Uh, living in 150 countries or 54 countries, belonging to local societies, you might call them chapters, but we call them societies, which means like-minded professionals will gather around important topics. So we mentioned the gold standards, lots of regulatory bodies across the globe will use the CFA as a reference for people working in the industry and might ask for it as a prerequisite to exercise your role as an analyst, financial analyst or portfolio manager, etc. Um, the, the ethical foundations do not only belong to CFA Institute, some other professional, professional bodies did adopt them like Kaya and others, uh, FRM, etc. So other professional bodies are using our code of standards and ethics because they are the minimum you would expect from a professional to apply in his career and in his dealing with clients' money. Um, unmatched ex expertise, um, because year after year, we ask the professionals of the industry to tell us what do they need from the new generation of CFA charter holders in terms of technicity, knowledge, experience, and then we include this in the program. So it's very important to go into a program like the CFA program, Chartered Financial Analyst. It's more important that the program gets updated year after year to reflect the needs of the industry and the needs of the professionals working in the financial industry. Um, I mentioned how many 180,000 members across the globe in 164 countries. And it's very important to work with universities because uh, young talents start showing their muscles and knowledge at university and their brains are still fresh to acquire new uh, knowledge and, and, and really kickstart their careers on the right foot, I would say. So we are seeing more and more universities partnering with us and, 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 and enjoy, in engaging in the CFA program. Thank you very much. I might touch quickly on, on uh, this uh, certificate in performance uh, measurement, um, certificate, certificate of investment performance uh, measurement, sorry. And in two words, uh, as a professional, if you're managing your own uh, portfolios or selecting others' portfolios, this is also a great designation uh, to have, uh, which means you will be able to dissociate between luck, believe it or not, you, you sometimes you're lucky as a portfolio manager and you have good performance, and skill. And skill is more difficult uh, uh, to, uh, to acquire. It needs hours and hours of study and experience. 
But again, before becoming a, certif uh, a certified investment performance measurer or having the CIPM, uh, you will have also to complete the ethics curriculum. So as much as in the CFA program, also with the CIPM program, you have to pass the CF, uh, sorry, the ethics uh, program. So it's applied widely. Uh, it is one of uh, the, the professions that will help you become GIPS compliant, global investment performance standards that the Institute uh, created. And these standards are all about transparency and fairness in producing your numbers. So people who study and become CIPM uh, holders, charter holders, are people who contribute and help their organizations to become GIPS compliant, are people who select external managers based on skills. They can measure the risk and uh, the risk adjusted returns, but mainly, mainly uh, they are people who uh, foster transparency and fairness in producing uh, performance numbers or investment performance numbers. So I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, William. Um, we, we are happy to have uh, a second speaker from CFA Institute who will also cover uh, um, the financial education and ethical aspects from a, a different uh, angle of um, uh, CFA certification programs. Um, Klaus, over to you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to present today. Uh, among the different uh, financial literacy certifications and programs we do offer at the CFA Institute, because our goal is to broaden out investment knowledge and make sure we are relevant in today's investment environment, there are a couple of other programs uh, apart from the gold standard of the CFA Charter and the CIPM program that are for potentially a different audience and a more broad audience. One of the newest programs we have now we offer as a certification is a certificate in ESG investing, environmental, social, and governance. ESG, as many of us know, is one of the fastest growing and most important aspects to investment, the investment community and investment decision makers today. As we see on this slide, 76% of institutional investors, 69% of retail investors have an interest in ESG investing, and that is growing. Not only the interest, but governments and regulatory bodies across the globe are encouraging and demanding ESG as part of investment portfolios and ESG reporting in their investment process. So we have offered a certificate in ESG investing that delivers these skills, mindsets, and strategies to integrate ESG into the investment process. And very importantly, create a common language of what ESG means to both investment professionals and the broader community. Because as a newer and developing aspect of investment management, there are multiple terminologies. What does green investing mean? What does ESG mean? What is considered proper governance, et cetera? So having a certificate that's broadly and globally uh, accepted allows investors and the greater investment community to be speaking the same ESG language and understand the concepts. And as we see, because the demand is so high, this type of education and certification does allow not only portfolio management and investment professionals to understand ESG integration, it allows the client-facing staff to have important conversations with those asset owners and retail investors who are buying or investing in ESG-based uh, investments. The certificate that we have is, again, designed to be very broad, an introduction to ESG itself, and then goes individually into the three aspects, the environmental, the social, and the governance factors, not only as a description, but how they are involved and can integrate into a portfolio management and investment process. So we, we talk about these aspects, why they're important in the market, what is changing in the market, and then how to construct uh, investments and portfolios on this. Very critically as well, and one of the fastest growing aspects of ESG 
is government regulations and security market regulations. And this is happening not only in what would be considered more of the developed countries, but broadly globally, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia. These type of regulations and requirements are being demanded by not only investors, by government and regulatory bodies. So understanding not only the individual factors, but how they affect our investments as a whole is very, very important. And so we are very pleased to be able to present and offer a certificate in ESG investing for a broad, broader global audience, because clearly it's demanded in the marketplace and having that knowledge is going to help the broader investment community. Another certificate we offer that is actually even potentially more broad and at a different level is an investment foundations program. This program is actually designed for not only investment professionals, but with a nod to Paul Grimes and his presentation to any individuals as well that wants to educate themselves a little bit further on investments, on finance, and how it affects not only potential career, but affects them personally. So this program is what could be considered an entry-level program to provide this understanding of the industry, what a stock is, what a bond is, how diversification matters in portfolio management, goes into such critical aspects, again, as what Paul mentioned, as things such as fees and taxes that one would not normally consider in terms of thinking of an investment and return and risk. But all of these factors that are going to affect our underlying portfolio and our underlying investments, whether it's day-to-day -day investing in the markets or whether it is putting our actual retirement money to work and being very conscious of the risk and return. So this program is, uh, again, self-study, like all of our programs are, but it is designed a lot more broadly, not only for those in investment roles or those planning on going into potential investments, but those that are interested in personal investing, but other job functions such as IT, operations, accounting, administration. So the CFA Institute has a broad array of programs from the gold standard CFA charter that goes in-depth, three-level study program for those professionals, investment professionals that need that deep understanding and broad array of knowledge to CIPM, which is a little bit more focused on portfolio performance and manager selection, to ESG, which is actually even more broad in terms of its audience. So again, not just portfolio managers and analysts, but any of those client-facing or business analyst-type roles that need to understand how ESG affects the portfolios. And now this investment foundations program, which not only is broadened in terms of in, uh, job roles, but also is very appropriate for those wanting to increase their financial literacy from a personal standpoint. Clearly, with the markets becoming more and more complex and the investment world changing day to day, in financial literacy is clearly critical in everything we do, whether it's our personal investments, whether it's our retirement or taking care of our families, but also very much for your careers going forward. And that's why we are pleased to have this broad array of programs that is designed to help finance professionals, individuals, and anybody just broadly interested in financial literacy and its importance in the marketplace. So with that, I will, uh, I will leave it for now. Um, I will turn it back over and we're happy to uh, take any uh, questions. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we can now proceed to Q&A session. I think we have around uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So our viewers are welcome to um, ask questions through the chat function um, and we'll collect and respond. Um, Klaus, um, you mentioned about ESG and I think this is a really important topic with you know growing support as a communication professional. I know that ESG, uh, I think, is, is something that is being missed uh, from the you know, corporate communications of many organizations. Um, and um, you mentioned in your survey that there's 69% 69, 69 of retail investors actually 
are willing to do uh, you know the ESG investments. I think that's sort of brings up the pressure to to the financial services firms, but also to regulators to do more on on, on ESG disclosures. So now, and the question would go: How does your ESG certificate help with uh, financial literacy in the growing sustainable finance movement? Thank you for that question. Yes, it is. It is critically important, as you mentioned, that sixty-nine percent is is probably actually a, a smaller figure as the world grows more and more, and especially with the new generation coming into the investment community and finance community demanding ESG. What this program does is it not only describes the issues and the effect on the ESG on your portfolios and the broader investment community. But it also educates professionals and individuals on how the world is changing and growing and adapting to ESG. And as mentioned, the important aspect is the regulation. So it's not only the effect on, say, rising sea levels on an investment, but also the fact that we are going to have to do more reporting. We are going to have to restructure our portfolios and investments due to regulation. But clearly, regulations differ across the world. We want to have that be pretty common in the world because you don't want to have every country or every region where you're working or investing in have different set of performance standards or different set of requirements for investments. But equally, because the world is becoming more global in our investments and our strategies, we have to be very aware of what we can and cannot do in different parts of the world. But critically, understanding ESG not only allows us to understand the needs and desires of the asset owners who would be buying our investment services, but also the effect of the environment and governance as a whole on our investments: rising sea levels, increasing storms, uh, more worse weather, reduced crop yields. All of these are going to invest, uh, affect individual investments, but our portfolios as a whole. So not only will this help conversations with investors and help our decision making process, it will also help us to understand why the broader global environment is going to affect our individual investments as well. Klaus, thank you very much. Um, another question again. I think this is this is for CFA Institute. I don't know uh, whether you or, or William uh, want to respond. Um, if um, you know, if a person is you know non-finance professional, so what programs can help with financial literacy for non-finance professionals uh, or those just entering the financial markets? I would suggest investment foundations that Klaus uh, already covered in his presentation. So investment foundations is free of charge because it's part of our mission uh, to help uh, protect the end clients with more knowledge about financial markets and the sectors. So it's a basic um, level of knowledge in finance. It takes 90 hours to study it. And uh, you do the test online and you receive a certification. But again, it's our way of protecting the end clients from any wrong advice or helping them really build portfolios for their future retirement, future savings uh, programs, and future financial goals. So I would say if you work with uh, investment managers, but you are in the marketing sector or, or section, sorry, or you are in the legal section or HR or any other function that's supporting an investment function, you can also do investment foundations and then you can understand what's happening with those investment teams. And there's a point that uh, Klaus uh, showed earlier on, on a slide. It's a great gift from an employer to an employee to keep educating their uh, employees, to keep investing in the knowledge of their employees. And I think successful companies are those who invest in the knowledge of their employees. So it's another gift that an employer can give to their employees. It's our gift to the investment uh, world uh, and to the man and the woman on the street to know more about finance. So then when they have a conversation with a financial advisor, they really uh, discussing matters that they understand and they will take the best decisions for their own uh, portfolio. Thank you. No, I agree. I think it's a it's a great uh, program, um, and uh, you know, the, in the in the in the world where there is a lack of financial literacy, that that program sort of comes uh, in handy. 
And uh, one of the recent OECD surveys actually indicated that uh, I think there are 53% of uh, adult population were able to demonstrate only minimum you know, financial knowledge. And I think we're working, we're living in a circumstances where uh, people have uh, either minimum or very you know, low uh, or zero uh, you know, basic financial skills. And you know, there are online influencers, bloggers all over the world. Uh, all over the place in social networks like TikTok, Instagram, and they're all sort of um, trying to give an advice. Uh, some of them are, you know, very aggressive advice. You know, some of them are maybe not not enough professional. So I would uh, uh, commend uh, the CFA Institute, uh, you know, for actually uh, uh, participating in the World Investor Investor Week annually. I think CFA Institute has been a partner of of the World Investor Week for for years, and uh, so so as the um, um, professional uh, Planning Standards Board. Um, uh, it, uh, PF, PFSB is the, um, the long-time support of the World Investor Week. They, they, they do that. Uh, they, they, they take part annually in the World Investor Week. And, um, and my, my next question would go to uh, Paul. Um, Paul, would, if, um, you, know, what, you talked about the financial advisors, um, you know, how, how important it is to select the, uh, the right um, and ethical financial advisor. So what attributes should an investor look um, for when selecting for a financial advisor? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, <clears throat> I, and, and in my view, there, there are probably three key attributes. There, there are many, but I think three, three key ones. Uh, firstly, that the individual is appropriately qualified. And, and by that, I mean, they, they are qualified organization so <clears throat> pardon me uh you've listened to uh both financial planning standards board and uh the financial uh, institute both type of uh, uh, quality education to financial you want to make sure that your uh, advisor is registered I, i'm going to presume that the regulatory authority in kazakhstan has some form of of register of of uh, of uh, financial advisors uh, and 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 so there is some sort of oversight to to behavior coming from there and uh, and the third one i'd say is give give a thought to how you pay your financial advisor um so uh, I've already mentioned uh, fees. You, you just need to make sure that uh, you understand that if somebody is taking 3% commission on a product, what does that mean for you uh, in a low return environment? Uh, um, and you know, if, are they working on your behalf or are they working on behalf of an organization? So to William's point, which I think is well, uh, you know, both organizations have a have a code of ethics that is central to similar uh, in terms of preparing financial professionals to work with consumers and on the best interests of consumers. Great. Uh, thank you, Paul. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, we do emphasize all the time uh, to our sort of AFC community. Uh, that you know, if you want, you, if you want uh, financial services, then you know, make sure that you check that the person that the firm has a financial license, um, and you know that is sort of um, obviously something that is available in our public register. So any person can can check that uh, you know that the firm is licensed and to and license and what what the scope of license actually covers, and you know that is publicly available. And every time we uh, you know we we see that. Uh, there is a you know firm um, try, giving an unauthorized advice. We issue a consumer warning, and we always say you know uh, look um, if you want financial services, then make sure that the that the you know firm is properly licensed. And I think this is something that IOSCO always uh, conveys as part of their you know key messaging. Um, and 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 I think this is the first step actually for any retail investor to to, to do to check. Uh, so. Uh, you rightly uh, pointed out, um, and uh, Paul, and uh, another question for you. Um, you know, in, in the um, in the times of market uh, volatility like this, uh, what should investors? How should uh, investors um, uh, rebalance their portfolios? What would be your advice? 
Okay, uh, and, and I think I think this is a very interesting question. Um, to, to my mind, there's always a question as to whether you should rebalance the portfolio and what what is it that you are hoping to accomplish. Uh, there is there is um, vast swathes of research as to uh, the harm that can be caused through. Uh, pursuing rebalancing strategies that don't work <laughs> because because of an, inabil an inability to time the market perfectly as to when is the best time to sell and rebalance and so on. So uh, wh where one is pursuing a strategy of rebalancing where it's uh, it's trying to identify when is the peak time to sell and when is the peak time to buy, it invariably goes wrong. So if, if there's a rebalancing strategy, it ought to be one that is set up under some sort of a, a, a philosophical approach to investment management and has automatic triggers in it uh, where if certain conditions are met there is an automatic rebalancing and so the emotive sort of decision as to i'm the expert i know exactly when the markets are going to turn you take that off the table uh, entirely and and to that point uh, almas it comes back to dealing with the right type of person within the right type of organization uh, is the best approach to that. But, but for a, an individual who thinks they can time the market, um, it's, it's, it's foolhardy. It's foolhardy. It does not, it does not work out well. Yep. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, my next question would uh, go to William. Uh, William, you mentioned uh, in the beginning that uh, sort of, you know, this, all this, uh, uh, financial literacy and ethical aspects are sort of enshrined to the mission and the charter of uh, CFA Institute. So how does the CFA charter aid in financial literacy and, and why should firms and employees support the program? How the CFA program helps in financial literacy? Well, when you go through level one, you're understanding all the asset classes, you're understanding what are the building blocks that you can use later on in level two to create investment strategies and to start pricing those uh, investment solutions. And this will lead you to level three, where you will put all of this knowledge and, and, and technicity to work to manage uh, wealthy clients' portfolios or institutional clients' portfolios. So what I liked about the, the CFA program, studying, it, studying for it myself, um, was really that level one gives you the general knowledge you need to kickstart your journey. And ethics is 20% of that level one and 20% of level two and 20% of level three. So here we're not missing anything on, on the ethical side of things. But when it comes to understanding and managing later on clients' portfolios, you've been a generalist in level one. In level two, you become a technician and you can give a price to most of the strategies and the combinations of products that you will use later on. But level three was the most exciting part of the journey for me because at level three, I was able to build solutions as Klaus and Paul mentioned earlier, respecting the investment policy statement of my client, whether the client is institutional or private, I was able to take into consideration return, risk, tax, time frame liquidity, legal uh, aspects of, of that the client should be respecting, uh, and then some unique also considerations that my client will tell me, because as a trusted advisor, he gave me extra information that sometimes he doesn't give to his close family, maybe. But this is, this is the top of the top when uh, you are experienced in your career as a financial advisor, you studied for it, you have experience, and the three levels give you the, the right knowledge to ask the right questions. So then you are on the right track with your investors or with your clients, putting them first and leading them to their financial goals. So the, some people tell me, could I just take the level one for financial? See, I say, once you finish level one, you'll be so thirsty and hungry for more that you will go for level two and level three. But socially, you become already very weird because you are letting go all these parties and all these dinners and all these meetings because you want to study for level two and for level three. So all in all, it's worth the journey, it's worth the sweat, it's worth the sacrifice, because as Paul mentioned earlier in this conversation, what your clients expect from you is to be the expert, is to be the trusted one, is to be the partner for the long run. As much as your doctor is your partner for your health, 
your financial advisor is your partner for your wealth and they have to be experienced they have to be knowledgeable they have to be ethical but they have to be also sophisticated enough to ask you the right questions sometimes questions you don't want to be asked so then they lead you to the ideal portfolio uh, an ideal solution for the long run and as paul mentioned it has to be revisited it has to be rebalanced it has to be updated because some circumstances change for you and for your wife and for your family and you need to adapt uh, and take considerations take those into considerations thank you thank you william that was there were great points um, with that i have exhausted my questions and i think we can uh, round up and uh, our our webinar uh, comes to an end. Um, I would like to uh, express sincere appreciation to Paul, William, and Klaus for your great contributions. I think this uh, this was a very interesting uh, insights and and informative presentations. Um, I, I'd like to thank our viewers uh, of the World Investor Week, and um, we are we are completing this webinar. And our next webinar will start at uh, three thirty. Uh, the webinar protecting investors' rights uh, with the world class dispute resolution at the AAFC court and the International Arbitration Center. We'll start at 2.30. We'll see you in a few minutes.